All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Tuesday morning live stream Bible class from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Germantown in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. We thank you for taking some time out of your day or week to join us, whether you're watching live this morning or watching a pre-recorded version, a uh, recorded version of our of our class, either on our Facebook feed or our YouTube channel. Um, no matter how you're uh, with us, we certainly appreciate the time that you're spending with us to study God's Word as we continue our study of the beginning of the Book of Beginnings, the first 11 chapters of the Book of Genesis. And today we're going to begin our last lesson in this little series, um, which covers chapters 1 through 11. So this lesson was just a few moments ago posted in the Facebook feed um, for our church webpage, so if you just want to, um, our church Facebook page, I should say, so if you just want to scroll down a little bit, you should be able to find a link to uh, Genesis Lesson 07, um, and that is, uh, covers Genesis verses 10 and 11, so if you like to follow along in the study guide, then you want to pull that up. If you want to follow along in your Bible, then we're going to be reading chapters 10 and 11 today. You don't have to follow along with either one. You can just step back and listen. That would be fine, too. Um, but that's kind of kind of be the plan for today, is um, to work our way through uh, at least chapter 10 of the Table of Nations, and we can get into chapter 11, which is the Tower of Babel. So kind of two major uh, sections of the um, opening chapters of the Bible here in Genesis 10 and 11. But let's uh, begin our study of the word with prayer. So we pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks and praise that you have an upside down kingdom, a kingdom where the first is last and the last is first, where death, where life comes through death and glory comes through weakness. We ask that as we study your word, that you would help us remember these truths, that we might always be certain of our salvation and find in this world uh, the gospel of peace and, and forgiveness that your Son and our Savior Jesus has won for us through his weakness and through his suffering on the cross. We ask this in all things, in his holy name. Amen. Okay, so um, I just have a little introduction here for um, chapters 10 and 11. Um, chapters 10 and 11 are going to describe the uh, alienation of the nations of the earth. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about, um, in chapter 10, we'll see um, all the different nations of the earth are a representative sample of the nations of the earth that probably existed at the time of Abraham. And then in chapter 11, we'll find out why all of those different nations exist because of the scattering of the nations of the Tower of Babel. So, if you want to see what does chapters 10 and 11 have in common, you know, what, what brings them together, what, well, what makes them one unit, is that they have to do with the dividing of the nations, the spreading out of the nations. And I have the first introductory question is, what kind of factors divide the nations of the earth today? And the answer is there are all kinds of things that divide the nations of the earth. It could be race. Um, um, it could be uh, it could be politics. You know, it could be religion. Um, it could be um, it could be um, uh, Language could be language. In other words, some of the reasons why some people are in other some people are in um, other places is because of of language. Um, but the the point is that there are all kinds of things that divide um, the the nations of the earth today. There are all kinds of barriers um, that are between people today. And where um, what we want to look at in these chapters is what all these people have in common. Um, what what makes all of these, um, what makes uh, all people, um, what they have in common? They all have common ancestors. Um, we all are 
descendants of Adam and Eve. Um, we are all uh, descendants of um, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, so, um, so what unites the people of the earth today is that we all have a common um, background, a common ancestry. Um, and of course, what the Bible emphasizes is that we all have a common problem too. Um, we have the problem that we all share is a problem of sin. We also have a common savior. So Jesus has died to take away the sins of the whole world, not just some, but 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 all, but for the sins of the whole world. Um, we we have a a God who unites us, who sends His Son um, to be the Savior of the world. We have grace that unites us, this undeserved, unearned love of God um, that he has uh, poured out upon all the peoples of the earth. Um, so there's all kinds of things that unite us as people today. Um, all, the, all these different things that, that make us a part of, uh, of humanity in general, that we all share in, com in common with humanity. And if um, these chapters of the Bible remind us that there are differences or divisions among the nations of the earth. Then they also remind us that there are similarities, that there are um, significant uh, similarities between, um, between the different nations of the earth that exist in our world today. So this is kind of an introduction. There are all kinds of things that divide the nations of the earth, but there are also uh, many things that we have in common. And this section of scripture is going to kind of emphasize those two things. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read. Um, well, let's let's do some introductory thoughts about the Table of Nations before we read the Table of Nations. So let's just start by saying this. Genesis 10 makes for difficult reading. This is one of the most difficult sections of the Bible to read. Um, and it's because there are many unfamiliar names. And in fact, um, we're not even able to identify all of these names. These names would have meant something to Abraham or meant something to Moses and to his generation. Um, but they probably, but many of them don't mean anything to us today. So uh, some, a lot of these things are just names. A lot of these people are just, or places are just names. That's all we know is the name. We have no idea to what they refer. And um, and that kind of leads to the question, well, if there's all kinds of stuff that we don't know um, about this section of Scripture, then why did God include it in the Bible? Why is it a part of the, of the sacred record? Um, and I just have a couple of thoughts in there um, that don't, uh, to be honest with you, they don't answer that question. I can't answer why questions in the Bible. It, it's very difficult to answer questions why God did this or that. Um, but, uh, but what we can um, certainly know is that we, um, is that it is a part of God's inspired record, that God in his wisdom and, uh, and mercy has decided to include this table of nations divided up by the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, um, as a part of the sacred record. We know it's a one-of-a-kind document at least as far as we know, um, we found no other ancient Near Eastern document that is anything like this, that, that describes the, the nations of the, so, of, of the known world. Um, so it's, and, and free, at least as far as ancient Near Eastern or extant ancient Near Eastern um, documents go, this is one of a kind, you know, where it, where it describes the geog geographical spread of peoples um, and their arrangement by nation. Um, we, we suggest, we don't know, but we think it's likely that since this section of scripture takes place or is placed right before the Abraham account begins, that it's very likely that this is the way the world would have looked, or the, the ancient Near East anyway, would have looked at the time of Abraham. Um, so uh, again, this isn't a, an updated description of the clans and families and tribes of the world, but it's the way things probably would have stood 
at the time of Abraham because of its proximity to the story of Abraham. Uh, and then, uh, how are the nations divided up? It's not always clear what makes some nations go along with others. So it could be territorial, could be um, where, where in the world that they're living, so their country. It could be linguistic, so what languages are they speaking? It could be, and it seems especially in this section to be genealogical. So what, what um, family groups do they belong to? Um, so what, what clan do they belong to? Or it could be political. What are their, um, what are their politics? How do they organize themselves? Or what is the, um, what are the key ideas or the key values, the core values that they um, consider to be important? So again, we're not exactly sure what principle it is um, that um, that's being used as the basis for this organization, but. We do know that they're being organized, the nations of the earth, that's why it's called the Table of Nations, are being organized in some way um, to show us the way that the world um, or the, the, the people of the earth are scattered over the face of the earth. Some things to remember about the Table of Nations, it doesn't ever claim or pretend to be exhaustive. Um, in fact, there are 70 names in the chapter. For those of, uh, those of you who have um, gone through Revelation with me or gone through other, um, the end times class that we, when we were teaching in person, um, you know that um, that number 70 is an apocalyptically symbolic number. You know, this isn't apocalyptic literature. This is historical narrative. But it seems likely that that number 70 is is a symbol, it's symbolic. The number seven, number for completeness, and the number 10, the number for perfection. So this is um, a representative sample, a, a complete representative sample of the different places or kingdoms of the world. Um, so that's, um, so don't think that this is all of the nations that existed on the earth, but this is a representative sample of those nations. Um, the chapter is divided into three sections, so the descendants of Japheth, the descendants of Ham, and the descendants of Shem. Japheth is, as we'll note, Japheth is the father of the Gentiles, so the most scattered people. Um, the Hamites, remember Ham is the brother, um, is, the, is the ancestor of Canaan the Canaanites, whom the Israelites are going to drive out of the Promised Land. Um, so the Hamites are closely related to the Israelites, um, but are the enemies of Israel. And then, of course, the Shemites are Semites, <clears throat> or is the nation of Israel. Um, so you, you, there's a kind of a, a funnel shape you get from the, the nations that are farthest away from Israel and then you've got the nations that are close to Israel but are their enemies. And then that goes down to the nation of Israel itself um, and their allies. So um, that's the, 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 way the, or the way that the chapter is outlined. And then one, um, uh, another note is that the, um, that the nations are not described with the same degree of detail. Um, so you'll notice that the Japheth, um, the Japhethite section is the smallest, and then the Hamite section is a little longer, and then the Semite section is about the same size as the Hamite section. So the, again, the um, what is important or what matters most to Moses or to the inspired record, as this is being carried out, is um, is the remember this is sacred history. This isn't just a newspaper report of something. This isn't just information for the sake of information, um, but it is, uh, um, it's uh, salvation history. It's drawing us closer and closer to the, to the Messiah. And, um, and these, and these sections and, and these, uh, these first section of the Bible, chapters one through 11, 
we kind of have uh, salvation being played out on a grand scale. When we get to chapter 12, we're going to be introduced to the great father of the Old Testament people, Abraham. So, um, so it gets a little more, a little more specific. And so what we have going on in chapter 10 is that narrowing down. We started with the whole world and we're describing all nations, but we're going to be narrowed down to this one particular Semite, this one particular descendant of Shem, who is going to receive a special promise from God that will make him the father of, of many people. Um, the fathers of, of, of a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Um, so um, that's the uh, kind of the outline or the way that this is described. And then lastly, just to note that chapters 10 and 11 do not follow chronologically. Chapter 10 is not, um, chapter 10 actually happens after the events of chapter 11. So chapter 10 tells us how the nations of the earth spread out. Chapter 11 tells us what caused the nations of the earth to spread out. So um, just like we, we did at the beginning of the book, we said that chapters, um, uh, Genesis chapter 2, it does not chronically, chronologically follow Genesis 1. It is a restatement or a replay of Genesis chapter 1. So to here, um, Genesis chapter 11 actually comes before, in terms of chrono chronologically, um, comes before chapter 10. So chapter 10 lays out all the nations of the earth according to the clans of Shem, uh, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. But then chapter 11 is going to explain how it is that that came to be. How did it come to be that the nations of the earth were all spread out? So um don't think that, just, just make sure in your mind you recognize that 10 and 11 are separate, are, are separate things. Um, that 10 pro, pro, um, pro actually comes after chapter 11, or chapter 11 precedes chapter 10. Okay, so with those kind of preliminary comments, that's pretty much everything that I had to say about Genesis chapter 10. Um, and again, there's just, there's not a whole lot to say because it's a lot of unfamiliar names. Um, <clears throat> but let's go ahead and read it. We want to read it as a part. It's a part of God's inspired record. And we're studying Genesis 1 through 11, so we can't just skip one whole chapter. Um, so we're going to go ahead and read um, Genesis chapter 10. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. Notice we're going to start with the Japhethites. So the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, and, and what, what we're going to see is the, the, the first sons, sons are the ones that get counted. So the first son of Japheth is Gomer. So the sons of Gomer are Ashkenaz, Rip, um, Ripheth, and Togamarsh. Um, Togama, and then the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, the Kittites, and the Rodanites. From these are the maritime people spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations, each with its own language. So again, you can see the um, you've got people that are being grouped by region and people that are being grouped by language. Um, so there's no single way of dividing up the different um, the different peoples um, uh, uh, that are listed in the table of nations. So that's Japheth, the Japhethites. Again, done away with very quickly because they they're the farthest away. They have the least to do with this the story of salvation history, at least at this this point in salvation history. These are the Gentile clans. All right, how about the Hamites? The sons of Ham are Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush are Sheba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, and Sebek, Sab, Sabteca. The sons of Rama are Sheba and Dedan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. Um, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. So there's a, um, a little 
um, aphorism or a little statement that um, this great hunter is remembered, Nimrod, um, with the, the mighty hunter. So if you have somebody that's really powerful or a really great hunter, then you can say they're like Nimrod, the great hunter, the mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom, of Nimrod's kingdom, were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, Kelna, and, and Shinar. And remember that name, Shinar. We're going to come back to Shinar in chapter 11. From that land, he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir. And Ir is just the word for city. So um, literally the city of Rehoboth. Um, Kala and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Kala, which is the great city. Egypt, going back to the descendants of Ham. Remember, Cush was the first descendant, but now we have Egypt. Egypt was the father of the Ludites, Anamites, Lehabites, uh, Naphuites, Pathruzites, Kazthuhites, from whom the Philistines came, and the Kaphtarites. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zemorites, and Hamathites. And at least some of those names should sound familiar because these are the going to be the main tribes that Israel is going to have to wrestle with in their history, especially um, when you get names like um, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites. Some of the other ones, Archites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zemorites, and Hamathites are a little less familiar. But um, we're going to hear about the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, and Girgashites over and over and over again in the inspired record. Because these are going to be the, the nations of Canaan that are the most troubling to God's Old Testament people, that are the kind of the thorn in their flesh, the thorn in their side. So those are the Hamites. So we've got the Japhethites, the nations that are farthest away from Israel. You've got the Hamites, Egypt, and the um, Canaanite nations around the nation of Israel. And now we have the Semites. And this is you know, where the term anti-Semitism comes from, or um, Semitism, things that are related to the descendants of, of Shem. Um, so the Semites. So sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. This is the first time we get any kind of note about the um, the birth order. Remember that in the flood account, we hear the names are Shem, Ham, and Japheth, because Shem is going to be the, the lead figure. But here we learn that he is not the oldest, that Japheth is, is at least older than, we don't, we don't know whether um, Ham is the oldest. Um, but we know that Japheth is older than Shem. But Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. And this, this name Eber is, seems to be where the Jews get the title Hebrew from. Eber and Hebrew, are, they sound a lot together. So when you, um, Abraham is, gonna, is going to identify himself as a Hebrew. Um, that seems to be a reference to this clan or this family of the people um, of Eber. So the sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. So they're the Aramites. The sons of Aram are Uz, Hul, Gether, and Meshech. Arphaxad was the father of Shelah, and Shelah the father of Eber. So there's the Hebrews, Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg, because in his time the earth was divided. His brother was named Joktan. And Joktan was the father of Almadad, Shelef, um, Hazar Mapheth, Jareth, uh, Jera, sorry, Had Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimel, Sheba, Orphil, Havila, and Jobab. All these were sons of Jokden. The region where they lived stretched from Misha towards Sephar in the eastern hill country. These are the sons of Shem by their clans and languages and their territories and nations. These are the clans of Noah's sons, according to their lines of descent, 
within their nations. From these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. So again, I wish I had more that I could tell you about the about Genesis 10, about the table of nations. If you do want to kind of learn more, um, I'd encourage you to go on Answers in Genesis, um, which is the the group of people that built the Creation Museum. I know that they have a web page on the different table, of the different tribes and the table of nations, but a lot of it is conjecture. A lot of it we just don't know for sure because these are a lot of unfamiliar names. We just don't know um, the, the significance or exactly to what these names refer. Okay? With that in mind, we get back to... Um, back to the story that we can really follow, which is the account of the store of the uh, Tower of Babel. Um, so if you just kind of review the way that these chapters are set up, Genesis 1 and 2 describe the creation of the world. Genesis 3 describes the fall of humanity and the promise of the Savior. Genesis 4 and 5 describe the effect of the fall first by illustrating Cain and Abel in chapter 4, and then the genealogy and death record, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, of chapter 5. Chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9 are the story of the flood and its consequences. Chapter 10 is the table of nations, and now chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel. So that's just kind of the way that this, these first 11 chapters of the Bible um, are are organized, are, are spread out, okay? And um, um, so let's talk a little bit about the Tower of Babel. Let's read um, chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. And remember, chapter 11, chronologically, chapter 11 happens before chapter 10. So this little statement at the beginning of chapter 11 um, is was true before what we just read in chapter 10. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Remember I told you to remember the name Shinar for the next chapter. So this is that area where Nimrod builds his great cities. So the peoples of the earth settled there. Remember that's not what God told them to do. God told them to spread out and fill the earth and subdue it. But they find this nice place on the plain of Shinar, and they decide that's what they're that's where they're going to stay. They're going to settle down there. They said to each other, "Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly." They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they said, "Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves." Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth, which is exactly what God wanted for them, is to be spread out over the face of the earth. Um, so, um, so here's question. We're going back to our study guide now. Question number one. How does Genesis 11.2 express a change of attitude in the descendants of Noah? Um, so, for the most part, um, at least as far as, Shem and Japheth go. And I remember Ham had shown himself right from the very, very beginning as be, belonging to the line of the serpent. But um, but Shem and Japheth uh, show themselves as godly people, godly men who didn't want to shame their father even after his sin of getting drunk um, with the fruit of the vine. Um, but here um, we see the attitude has changed because they're no longer interested in carrying out the words of God. In fact, they're doing the exact opposite. God had told them to scatter and fill the earth, um, to scatter over the face of the earth. And now they're interested in, um, in staying in one place, flaunting the command of God, doing the exact opposite of what God wanted them to do. Okay. Um, number two, what's the significance of the plans to use brick and tar for the building of this city? And this is not supposed to be like a temporary place. This isn't supposed to be a, um, a stop along the way. They're not just building tents or temporary shelters. They mean to be building something 
um, permanent, something that is going to last. And so they're baking bricks and using tar for mortar. This isn't this isn't just a temporary building, but this is something that's meant to be a permanent dwelling place. Number three, the Bible repeatedly and emphatically warns us against the sin of idolatry. As illustrated in this section of scripture, what is the most dangerous idol of all? And I'm really thinking about verse four here, where they say, come, let us build ourselves a city. They're not interested in building God a city. They're interested in building themselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. And then here's the key phrase, so that we may make a name for ourselves. So here's where we've got the people of the earth are trying to make a name for themselves. Um, they're not interested in glorifying the name of God. Remember, you should um, hallow the name of God. Hallowed be your name, right, in the Lord's Prayer. Or do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, the second commandment. Um, so we don't, we don't use the, um, instead of glorifying God's name, they were trying to make a name for themselves. And so in, in a sense, the greatest idol of all is the idol of self. When we want to become God, when we try to take God's place, when we try to serve ourselves instead of the one who created us, then we've fallen into idolatry. In a sense, all idolatry is just uh, self-service of some kind or another. So the most dangerous idol of all, of all is the, the idol of self, wanting to make a name for ourselves. Okay, um, and now we can move on to the next section. So verses 5 to 9. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that people were building. The Lord said, and he's speaking to himself now, this is an internal dialogue. If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord God scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel or Babel. I mean, you can see in your footnote, Babel sounds like the Hebrew word for confused, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So just some questions about this section. Remember, we began our last section um, when we were studying chapter 8. We began with the discussion of anthropomorphisms and anthropopathisms. Um, and here we've got an example of an anthropomorphism, where God is described as coming down to see the city. Um, it's not as if God didn't already know what was going on in the city. Um, but uh, this is an example of an anthropomorphism where God is taking on a human characteristic or a human description um, in order to help us understand uh, better what, what is going on in the mind and heart of God. So an anthropomorphism that's being used there. What is the Bible teaching about God's judgment with this figure of speech? In other words, why does God come down to view the city and the tower itself? And um, one, of the, the, one of the messages that's teaching is that God's judgments are always just. They're always based on evidence. Um, they're always um, reactions to the truth. God doesn't judge randomly. Um, he's not uh, he uh, he's he's not the kind of God that wakes up on the wrong side of the bed on the wrong on, on a day and just is in a bad mood and so brings judgment upon people for no reason. Um, he is he always is acting on his divine knowledge. He's always judging on the base of on the basis of his. Um, his superior knowledge of what's going on. So he's he, he comes down to see if the situation with the with the tower is as bad as his knowledge knows is it knows is it knows it to be. Um, when we get to the next section of, of Genesis, when we get to the story of Abraham, he's going to do the exact same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah. 
the cries of the, of the injustice and the violence of Sodom and Gomorrah have gone up to heaven. And so God and his angels are going to come down and see for themselves just how wicked Sodom and Gomorrah have become. That's an anthropomorphism. God didn't need to come down and see. But because his judgments are always just, because he always ba just uh, bases his judgments on the, on the, the basis of evidence, um, then uh, he is described anthropomorphically as being um, as as coming down to see for himself whether things are as bad as he has made them out to be or as he knows them to be. Um, number five, this is one of my favorite questions of all time um, um, when it comes to Genesis, the book of Genesis, is that Martin Luther and his commentary on Genesis. Now, maybe we'll just make a little comment here. If you're going to read Martin Luther, don't read Luther on Genesis. Martin Luther lectured on Genesis very early in his career at Wittenberg, before the Lutheran Reformation had really taken place. And so um, Luther on Genesis is not really particularly helpful. Um, he's still very much a Roman Catholic, um, and he's kind of repeating the normal Roman Catholic teachings of the day, a very um, scholastic way of doing theology. Um, so um, Luther on Genesis is not the best Luther to read. You want to read later Luther, um, you know, after the Lutheran Reformation has taken hold and he's officially broken from the Catholic Church, um, you know, like the Lutheran Confessions, like the small cult articles, like the large and small catechism. Those are, that's the the kind of Luther that you want to read. But um, Luther and his commentary and his lectures on Genesis suggests that what God did at Babel was a far more severe judgment than what God had done at the flood. I just want you to think about that for a second. Which is the greater judgment, the flood or what happens at Babel? And you might say, you might make the argument that the greater judgment was what happened at the flood, because at least as far as Babel goes, nobody died. You know, when the flood came, it wiped out every living creature that had the breath of life, and it saved those that were on the ark. So um, at first, this claim that the, the judgment that comes upon Babel is greater than the judgment that comes on the flood, that kind of seems like a stupid thing to say. It kind of seems like nonsense. But I think that Luther is absolutely right here. Um, and the, the reason is um, the flood only affected one single generation. Granted, it wiped out that generation. Um, so the, the impact on that one generation was as severe as an impact can be. But it only applied to that, the people of that world. And God immediately makes a promise and never again will he destroy the world by means of a worldwide flood. So the um, as severe as the flood as a judgment is, and I'm not in any way trying to suggest that it wasn't a severe judgment, but it, it was a severe judgment, but its severity was limited to one generation, to one group of people, to the generation of the flood, the generation of Noah. Whereas the judgment that comes with the Tower of Babel, confusing languages, is something that we still see dividing nations in the world today, centuries and centuries, millennia and millennia later. Um, so the, the judgment that God brings at Babel continues to divide nations today. Um, it continues to be a reason why um, there is discord or, or dis, um, uh, disunity among the nations of the earth is because we tend not to trust people that don't speak the language that we speak. Um, so that, that's the sense in which Luther suggests it's a far greater judgment, is that it has, le as if it has affected every generation since then. The flood only affected one generation. But um, since, ever since the Tower of Babel, the effects of, of sin have been, um, have been um, affected the people of the world. So I think I think Luther is absolutely right when he when he suggests that's the case, um, when he suggests that this is a greater judgment than what happened um, at the flood. 
But here's another way of thinking about it. And I, this, this also has similarities to the flood. So question number six, um, how is, so I'm at the top of page three, how is God's intervention at Babel an act of grace? Remember that we said when we talked about the flood, we said, yeah, the flood is a tremendous act of God's judgment. There's no doubt about that. Um, a tremendous act of God's judgment. But it was ultimately also an act of God's grace, because if he hadn't wiped the earth clean, the violence of the earth would have put the line of the Savior at risk. So the reason why the flood came was to preserve, ultimately, was to preserve the line of the Savior. So um, the flood is at the same time an act of judgment and of salvation. That's exactly the point that Peter makes in 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, that while it is a judgment against the people of the earth, that, that very in that very same act, God saved Noah and his family. A very similar thing happens here when it comes to the Tower of Babel. On the one hand, it is true that it's a judgment that God separated the languages of the earth. On one hand, it is it is a judgment, or it's true that um, that they that people are divided. Um, people are, are are not getting along because of the division that comes of the Tower of Babel. And yet, at the same time, this is the way that God's word actually works out. Um, this is this is where this is the way that God's command that the people of the earth spread out over the face of the earth comes to fulfillment. This is the way that God actually gets the people to do what He had told them to do which was to spread out over the face of the earth. Um, so in that sense, it's an act of grace. It's an act that leads the people of God or leads the people to do the thing that God had commanded them to do, which is to spread out over the face of the earth. So an act of God's grace in the sense that it leads them into a life of obedience. Um, number seven and eight are kind of discussion questions. So number seven, why is this account of the Tower of Babel chosen as the first lesson for the festival of Pentecost? And I want you to think about what happens at, at Pentecost. At Pentecost, the, the disciples are gathered in the upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. The Holy Spirit comes and and the and two manna, a double manifestation. He comes with the, the sound of the wind, and he comes in, in tongues of flame, which settle over the heads of the disciples. And suddenly the disciples begin to proclaim the gospel in the native languages of the peoples who are gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. Um, so you have... Um, that that then that which divided nations language um is is being given that that gift is being given to the apostles in a sense pentecost is the undoing of the tower of babel the tower of babel divided the nations of the world by language but by pouring out the ability to speak languages on the apostles on pentecost um, he allowed them to proclaim the gospel in the original language or in the native language of the people who were gathered there in the city for the festival. Um, and this is a sign or a symbolic gesture that the gospel is meant for everyone. It's meant for people of all nations and all tribes. We want the gospel to be in every native language. By the way, we it isn't. Um, there, are, there, are, there are people out there in our world who cannot read the Bible in their own language, or at least not read the whole thing in their own language. There are translation efforts that are still going on in our world today to put God's word into the, the, the native languages of, those, of the people of the world. Um, and so uh, just a, um, kind of an interesting connection between the Tower of Babel and Pentecost um, the Tower of um, the Tower of Pentecost is kind of the undoing of the Tower of Babel. It's kind of the um, whereas the Tower of Babel divided nations by confusing language, um, that the um, festival of Pentecost 
unites the people by giving the apostles the ability to speak in multiple languages. And then number eight, true or, true or false, the multiplicity of languages on earth is the testimony to human ingenuity. Um, and this is the kind of thing that people in our world would like us to believe, that um, the fact that we have all of these languages is evidence that we are really smart people, that we can come up with all these languages. But in reality, the, the different languages of the earth are evidence of human, not human ingenuity, um, not, um, not human intellect, but human sin. The reason there are so many languages is a direct result of human sin. And so this is false. Um, the, the, mul the multiplicity of languages on the earth is not because of man's ingenuity, but because of God's grace, of God's intervention in the world. Um, because of what God did to, uh, to, to stop this building of a tower for the sake of the, the idolatrous desires of the, of the Babel generation. Okay, I'm inclined to stop there. We will meet again next week, Tuesday of Holy Week. Um, Jesus taught in the temple on Tuesday of Holy Week, so it's appropriate for us to gather around God's word. Um, on Tuesday of Holy Week. So we will meet next Tuesday. We'll finish this lesson from Genesis 11, and we'll start Genesis 12, which is the story of Abraham. So what we're going to do next on our Tuesday morning studies is um, launch into the story of Abraham, the life of Abraham, which um, takes us from 12, and I want to say through 20, I think 12 through 22, so 11 chapters um, it will take us through. So um, that's what we'll be doing after we finish next week. We'll finish up this um, study of the first 11 chapters, and then we can push into chapter 12. But let's um, close our study of the word with prayer. So we pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your grace and, and mercy, um, and yet also in judgment, you brought confusion to the languages of the earth but that you have undone this by Pentecost, and that you have assured us that the gospel is for all people of all time. Help us to hear in our own native language the truth that you love us and the gift of your Son, and help us to communicate that message to the very ends of the earth. Be with us until we gather again around your word next week to continue to grow and be built up in our faith, certain of your unfathomable love for us in Christ Jesus. We ask this in all things, in his holy name. Amen. So thank you very much. God's richest blessings to you um, as we begin our celebration of Holy Week um, next week. See you next week.